Hi everyone. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining today's today's webinar. So, um, good morning, good afternoon, or uh, good evening, depending where the where you are in the world. Um, my name is David McDade. I'm a training lead with Risk Tech Solutions, um, and I'm based in the UK. So, thanks very much for taking the time to join us today, uh, and welcome to this Risk Tech webinar, which is uh, part of Series Nine. Um, so this is the second in a short series of two webinars, uh, which we've we've put in uh, as we lead up towards the festive period. Um, so the subject of today's webinar is the past, present and future of hydrogen. Um, and we look at this from a risk tech perspective, uh, including some discussion around hydrogen itself, uh, some background, um, some case studies, uh, and then we'll be looking at some of the services that we are providing in these areas. Um, so I hope that we're providing some practical uh, insights for you um, if you're working with hydrogen now or you expect to in the future, um, hopefully you'll find something worthwhile today. So the webinar is going to take about 45 minutes roughly with about 30 minutes presentation and 15 or so minutes for Q&A, although we might go towards uh, nearer towards the hour if we, uh, we've got a lot of questions. Okay, so everybody's muted um, just so that we there won't be any distortion and background noise. But if you would like to ask a question, um, and we do encourage you to ask a question, then please just use the Q&A function. Um, and you can do that by uh, clicking on the speech bubble in the middle of the controls at the bottom of your screen. So you'll see the Q&A button in there. Um, I'll keep track of the questions. Um, so you can type them in at any point uh, during the presentation. Uh, and then at the end, we'll, we'll aim to cover as many as we can uh, and within the time we have available. OK, so just a little bit about risk tech then uh, before we get going. Um, if we could go to the next uh, slide. Yep. So um, we provide risk and safety management services uh, to businesses where the impact of loss is high. Um, we've got five main service sectors, which is consulting, uh, learning and training, which is right up to MSC level. Uh, we've got resourcing, if uh, uh, anyone has any need for associates, etc. Inspection services and uh, research and development services. So if you need to know any more about any of these, I would just encourage you to go to our website, which is uh, risktech.tuv.com. Okay, so today's speaker then. Um, just a little bit about him. So today uh, it's Nick Taylor. Um, Nick is a principal consultant based in the Derby office in UK, uh, and he's currently supports uh, the Two of Rhineland Hydrogen Centre of Competence. So Nick uh, works with Bristech and and closely with Two of Rhineland as well. So uh, Nick was joking earlier; he was amazed to see twenty five years here, but uh, time passes quickly, doesn't it? So um, Nick has now got twenty five years of experience. Uh, in the industry, including uh, electrical engineering control systems, um, design and commissioning of distributed power systems, safety assessments, uh, functional safety, equipment health monitoring, system safety engineering. Um, and you'll see also their uh, training delivery, which is something that Nick's been quite involved in recently. Um, OK, so uh, without further ado, Nick, I'll just hand over to you. <clears throat> okay, th uh, thank you, Dave. Thank you. And um, uh, like, like, like Dave says, welcome to the webinar here with Risk Tech. Okay, uh, so just to, uh, just first of all, before I start, I must apologise. I have a bit of a cold, um, so if I croak or cough during this webinar, then uh, please uh, accept my apologies. I'll try not to make it too bad. <clears throat> okay, so uh, an introduction. What are we going to be talking about? I'm just going to be looking uh, for those who who don't know uh, an awful lot about hydrogen and the the scope of hydrogen and the opportunity in industry. I'm, I'm going to be looking at the the various things that are available um, and the various places that hydrogen will be adopted. Um, I'm going to look at where it fits in industry and in fact in the world and what this thing called the hydrogen economy actually may look like. Uh, we've got some uh, business development insights from from our own uh, company project experience. <clears throat> uh, so we'll be talking a bit about that. Uh, th then uh, we're going to look at just a couple of case a uh, couple of case studies, uh, some interesting points there, and then we take a look on where the future may take us, uh, both as a as a company ourselves, 
um, and maybe for other companies to, uh, to to look for as well. And and then uh, finally, I'll, I'll finish on a bit of the uh, to Rhineland relationship and, and what they can offer the market. Uh, you'll see a, a, a couple of pictures uh, on the right hand side there. Uh, really, I include these because it shows uh, the diversity uh, of where hydrogen technology can be deployed. So uh, on the top there, we've got a motorbike. Uh, I, I believe that's a Honda patent picture, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so we could have a hydrogen power motorbike. Brilliant. OK, uh, on the right hand side, uh, we've got something that will be familiar to uh, most people, uh, certainly in the UK anyway. Uh, where we are now having hydrogen ready boilers. So this is a thing that generates our hot water in the UK. Uh, most houses have one. And if you go and buy one now, it will say hydrogen ready on it, so probably. Uh, and then this picture down here is uh, it's quite an old picture now, uh, but it is not, nonetheless uh, relevant because it is a laptop powered by hydrogen. OK, so just, just uh, an example of the, 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 the places uh, that you could expect to see hydrogen uh, in the future. So from consumer electronics through to personal transport and uh, in our houses for heating. Okay, so <clears throat> just a, a little bit about hydrogen and its physical properties. So uh, ba ba basic chemistry uh, education will tell you that it's the lightest element. It's right up there at the top of the periodic table. Uh, and that's basically because of its uh, small molecular size. It's the smallest molecule we know. Uh, and, and that means that it leaks, uh, so it can leak between small gaps that w ordinary things wouldn't leak through, uh, approximately 50 times higher than water, uh, 10 times higher leak rate than nitrogen, five times that of propane and three times that of natural gas. And the, the natural gas one there is uh, relevant, uh, and we'll, we'll find out why uh, in, in a bit. <clears throat> OK, we can, uh, we've got evidence of hydrogen permeating through unbroken material. So it can get out even when there's no get when there's no connection and no gap, uh, and it has this uh, ability to cause uh, hydrogen embrittlement, uh, which means the actual hydrogen itself diffuses into the metal structure uh, and causes all sorts of uh, failures uh, over time under certain conditions with particular types of metal. Okay, so <clears throat> it, it, it comes out and it damages um, pipe work and things. Uh, it's also colourless and odourless at ambient pressures. Okay, uh, when it when it burns, it has uh, in in daylight anyway an invisible flame, very low radiant heat. Uh, you'll see the picture on the right hand side where there's a hydrogen flame at night in comparison to a propane flame. Okay, so you can see that even at night the uh, the difference in visibility between a propane flame and a hydrogen flame is is notable. OK, and this comment with the low radiant heat means your, your hand, your hand can be uh, very, very close to a hydrogen flame uh, without feeling it. And the first time you felt it, uh, you'd have your skin burnt off, um, which, which is uh, not, not useful uh, and obviously pre presents a safety issue. Uh, so we, we have uh, a low ignition energy. We see the picture on the right hand side where uh, at the bottom of the curve here, um, the, uh, the the stoichiometric concentration, which is 29%, I think, requires uh, just uh, an ignition energy of 0.017 millijoules, which is about a factor of 10 uh, different to uh, to propane or methane. Okay, and one uh, one not often talked about property of hydrogen is that it's considered to be a, a secondary greenhouse gas. It it has a small effect, but it has an effect nonetheless, and it wouldn't be a balanced argument unless we mentioned it. Um, so it, uh, it it affects the distribution of methane uh, in the atmosphere. OK, so <clears throat> there, there's lots of good, good stuff around hydrogen. But there's, there's also some not, not so good stuff. Uh, the final point is the, the boiling point. So liquid hydrogen uh, occurs at or stops being liquid at minus 252.9 degrees centigrade. So pretty blooming cold. OK, so if, if you uh, if you look at those bullets, uh, we've got something that that leaks. Uh, it has a it has a, a higher leak rate than most things that we use. Uh, it damages uh, equipment. Uh, you can't smell it, you can't see it, and it's likely to ignite. Uh, and as a summary of those, you can appreciate, I'm sure, the uh, additional safety profile and the additional risk associated with the adoption of hydrogen um, in in society. OK, so some some key hazards to think about then are the flammability. Uh, OK, so we, we've got to deal with that. We've got to mitigate 
the flammability hazard uh, and the likelihood of explosion. Uh, the small molecule presents a hazard to us, so we have to think about that. <clears throat> Certainly in terms of um, materials compatibility. So again, uh, the uh, the hazard of <laughs> material incompatibility uh, is something that we need to uh, manage in our designs. Uh, asphyxiation. So it is odorless, it is colourless, so you can't smell it if it's coming out. And so there is likelihood of displacing oxygen and therefore asphyxiating people in enclosed spaces. Uh, and generally, uh, we would use it at high pressure uh, because the, the energy density, the volumetric energy density is relatively low. So we have to compress it <clears throat> to approximately 700 bar. For example, uh, at a, uh, uh, a car refueling station has a 700 bar option in order to reduce the amount of space required for storage. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the low boiling point there. Uh, presents its own hazards <clears throat> associated with their uh, cryogenics and cold surfaces. Okay, so just some uh, top level hazards to, to think about uh, as a result of the bullet points and the characteristics mentioned. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, in, in hydrogen systems, we, we get uh, some typical technology. So uh, the, the key thing to, to note here uh, is that the, the types of equipment are fairly, should be at least fairly familiar to people who work in process industries anyway. So we have uh, storage vessels. We have a, a diagram there of a, um, a carbon fiber storage vessel. Uh, we've got pipes, joints, sealed, okay, standard stuff. We've got flow controls. Again, nothing unusual in a flow control. Um, we've got uh, compressors. <clears throat> you know, you know the, these things are compressors like you'd have a compressor normally, but they were clearly, um, particular design characteristics which need to accommodate the characteristics of hydrogen uh, pressure relief systems the same again uh, what one of the the novelties uh and the novel technologies in hydrogen systems is this is the electrolyzer <coughs> uh, also uh in in the other way around it's uh, used as a fuel cell so electrolyzers generate hydrogen and fuel cells use similar technology to generate electricity from hydrogen Okay, and we've got the architectures on the right hand side of a couple of um, standard te technologies for providing the electrolysis. So we have a, an alkaline electrolyzer on the left hand side here, uh, and we have this thing called a proton exchange membrane electrolyzer on the right hand side. Okay, so th th these are things you wouldn't see generally uh, in anything but a hydrogen system. Okay, uh, <clears throat> due to various uh, characteristics of, of hydrogen, um, it's often seen that ammonia may be a more practical method of transporting hydrogen. Um, and so uh, what, what we're looking at so, so in some cases is uh, cracking ammonia in order to generate hydrogen to ease the transportation burden. Okay, so ammonia crackers uh, are... are uh, also seen uh, and then of course we've got control and instrumentation so no, no process will be complete without the relevant control uh, and measurements and safety systems around it okay so, so some some uh so, some novel technology but mostly familiar technology uh for people who know about process industries okay <clears throat> and it, it wouldn't be a uh, safety uh, related um Presentation really without the recognition that um, hydrogen has caused uh, severe accident and uh, fatality over over history. Okay, so we, we could go back many years, but we've got these three examples here. So uh, fuel station in Norway, um, some some debris into the public domain. <clears throat> I don't think any fatalities were there, uh, but the knock on effect on the business was quite severe. Uh, I've got a, a hydrogen explosion in South Korea. I, I believe there are fatalities here. And of course, the building looks like it's seen some severe damage, so it's uh, to be expected. And then again, uh, over in uh, in Illinois here, uh, for an example of what a hydrogen explosion can do. Okay, I, I don't want to dwell on that really, uh, but but it, we, we we need to keep ourselves ourselves relatively sober in these things um, because we we have to respect the danger that this new technology of hydrogen is presenting to us. And you can see all sorts of incident examples. Uh, and I'll give you the link there <coughs> to, to provide that. OK, so you may have heard of hydrogen in various different colours. So uh, I, I thought it is entirely right to, to just provide a bit of clarity around what those colours are. So uh, we, we've got 
uh, a grey, blue, turquoise and green. Uh, so at the left hand side, uh, grey hydrogen is where uh, most of our industrial hydrogen comes from. I think something like 95 percent or more uh, comes from methane or coal, fossil fuels in general, yeah, using steam met methane reforming. Uh, and this is um, <clears throat> But basically a, a fairly dirty way of producing the hydrogen that we use around us at the moment for, for various things uh, in, in various industries. OK, uh, slightly cleaner is blue hydrogen uh, and blue hydrogen is the same as grey hydrogen, except it's had its carbon stripped out uh, and stored or used elsewhere. <clears throat> OK, so, so we're, we're getting there. There's, there's a lot of technology involved in that. Uh, how, how do we take the carbon out? Where do we put the carbon? And it has, there's lots to think about in that. So it's it's not it's not an easy project to uh, to achieve. Uh, and then uh, next one along uh, turquoise. So we're getting closer to the green uh, the green status, aren't we? Um, uh, for methane, uh, again another technology. So we 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 <coughs> are going through the um, the pyrolysis process to, on on methane. Uh, feedstock to generate our hydrogen. So, okay, that, that sounds a bit nicer. Um, but ultimately, and where <clears throat> there is a lot of interest at the moment is in the use of renewables to drive electrolyzers to generate this thing called green hydrogen. Uh, and, you know, the uh, the thought of using green hydrogen uh, to uh, to smooth out demand and load on a wind farm uh, is is a, a nice and elegant proposal, I think, and th that's ultimately uh, where we want to get to as part of the energy mix going forward. Uh, so so we're, we've got these calls, but let's not forget there are others. So pink uh, is hydrogen generated by electrolysis using nuclear energy, and then yellow uh, is uh, by a mix of renewables. So you could have a solar power plant and a biomass plant, and you could probably have a wind farm in there as well for good measure. Uh, so if there is a combination of of renewable sources, then we're calling that yellow. Okay, uh, it, it's uh, probably worth noting uh, there's not a an industry or global standard for these things, but I believe that um, these are the colours that have have arisen from uh, various uh, sources, and everyone everyone seems to pick them up. Okay. So in the uh, in the introduction there, uh, I, I I talked about something that, that I refer to anyway as the scale of the opportunity. So where can hydrogen take society? And where can society adopt hydrogen uh, for the purposes of deca <coughs> decarbonisation? Well, this this diagram uh, I think allows anybody to place themselves in the hydrogen economy. So if you work uh, in a power station, for example, uh, you may end up, you may be able to put yourself uh, down here. If you work in uh, natural gas production, you're here, you're, so you're in the hydrogen economy already because it goes to the methane reformer and it comes onto the distribution network. If you are a bus driver, then you place yourself down here because we've got hydrogen buses and hydrogen in use for transport in various forms. Uh, if you are a nuclear physicist, then you can be here because we've got the pink hydrogen we just talked about, and then you can go into an electrolyzer and put hydrogen into the distribution network. Okay, uh, so I, I would I would challenge uh, anyone on the call to uh, to find themselves a place on there and and recognize and understand that uh, in one shape or form. Um, there will be in the future an option to adopt hydrogen in your day-to-day -day life. Okay, so let's take it back to those characteristics and let's take it back to the fact that it's odorless and colorless and has a tendency to ignite quite easily. Uh, and we're talking about using it for, for cooking and, <coughs> and heating and things like that. Therefore, we have to think about hazard identification. We have to think about risk management in a, in a grown-up and normal manner. And, and these are industries uh, where high hazards and hazard management, hazard mitigation are perhaps not the uh, robust process that they are over on the left, for example, in the oil and gas industry or in the uh, <coughs> nuclear industry. OK, so de de very definitely a shift making, potentially making uh, these uh, these industries on the right uh, uh, in, in need of uh, risk reduction, which perhaps they're not currently familiar with. 
OK, <clears throat> so in terms of the value chain, there's a bit more detail here uh, in terms of the, uh, the technologies that we can see. So uh, in, in the power, we're talking about um, you know, uh, the, the classics of wind power, solar, nuclear and conventional. So they're, they're all used. Uh, we've got electrolysis, electrolyzers, uh, steam, re steam reforming. Yes. And pyrolysis. OK, but storage of hydrogen is a challenge. Uh, we can actually store hydrogen underground, uh, and this is it comes into play in the blue hydrogen uh, aspects. Uh, we can store it in tanks, and we can store it as other chemicals. Okay, uh, when we're transporting hydrogen, we can use trucks, use existing um, tankers. Uh, we can re we can potentially reuse uh, pipelines and high pressure pipelines that are in existence as long as we have identified the uh, materials compatibilities. Remember the embrittlement project uh, problem and the leakage problem. What's the integrity of our existing network and is it suitable for hydrogen is a question. OK, and then when we're talking about distribution, uh, we can again use the existing network uh, as, as long as we can show that the, the risks associated with the characteristics of hydrogen are managed. Uh, maybe we want to have a dedicated hydrogen network if the current gas distribution network is not thought to be adequate. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's obviously a cost consideration there. And then we've got all these applications here. So uh, I think uh, heat, for homes and businesses and power and mobility we've talked about in the previous picture uh, as an industry feedstock. So uh, using hydrogen in the steel industry, for example, in ammonia production, uh, ammonia is an important industrial compound. Yeah, steel production uh, and methanols are all useful applications of things. Uh, it's just a question of getting it there and using it in the right way. OK. <clears throat> However, there are challenges. Um, so, that, so some of these projects can be complex if we are reusing uh, existing um, uh, assets, for example. OK. Uh, decisions on robustness with regard to investments and taxes. OK, so it, it, it's potentially complex. Uh, we may have to integrate new technology. <clears throat> How can hydrogen technology, electrolyzers, for example, be integrated? OK, let, let's think about uh, blast zones and things like that. So, you know, well, if you've got a crowded plant, may, maybe we've got some additional difficulties to, to manage in. Uh, licensing issues. Uh, with with, uh, with with hydrogen stored on mass, uh, yeah, insurance, uh, risk management, and things, all all stuff that we know about already. Okay, so we know about licensing, we know about insurability and technical risk management, we know about compliance and conformity. These are these are challenges that exist with hydrogen projects as well as they exist with projects that we are more familiar with. Okay, environmental impacts and personnel qualifications. So we. You know, we, just as we would address these complexities um, with current projects, uh, we would also need to do them for hydrogen projects. OK. Uh, so let, let's just have a look at what we've seen as a business. Uh, and, and this gives us uh, an indication of how our hydrogen business has grown uh, since 2017. OK, and, and you, you can see there's a, a fairly sharp rise uh, towards this year, and we do hope it'll uh, keep going. Uh, and we believe that that is indicative of uh, our lo long term relationships coming to us for hydrogen work and new clients coming to us for hydrogen work as well. OK, so uh, what 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 we're really saying there is that uh, over time, our hydrogen projects have ramped. Uh, we are growing in 2022 in sympathy with the overall market. OK, so what we're seeing uh, matches the, the level of investment put in between uh, over the past uh, 18 months, two years, perhaps, and certainly up to 2020. So if we extrapolate that, then the future is quite exciting uh, for hydrogen projects in the risk management world. OK, so <clears throat> of, of that growth, uh, what have we actually seen and what have we actually done? OK, and what, what are people coming to us for? And I talk about us, but really, what, what are people needing? You know, what, what are people who are embarking on the hydrogen journey actually requiring from external companies? Uh, so uh, the, 
let's have a look. So uh, f- physical effects molding. So that's been a, a relatively small part of our uh, of our work. So you know what 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 is the impact? <clears throat> uh, but by and large, what most people come to us for is uh, has up as idea loper study. So we've obviously done a, a bigger number of those than anything else, uh, and and that's that's right. These are these are techniques that that we've uh, refined and that people in industry uh, use all the time. Uh, it, it is a, it is appropriate for hydrogen projects as it is for any other high hazard project. That the difference is that some people who are coming to us haven't worked in high hazard industries before, and they're being asked by their ultimate users to do a has up or to do a has ID or, or whatever safety study it may be, um, and so therefore they need that external help. Okay, so uh, safety support <coughs> is uh, for, for, uh, we'll we'll come on to an example of safety support later, uh, but f- fundamentally this is. Where people have just felt like they need um, a, a, a safety partner on board to help them plan and appease their regulator and keep the uh, uh, local planning inspector happy and just to demonstrate that they have taken a proactive approach to safety. And th- this is really great to see because uh, what what it what it shows is that people who are beginning their hydrogen journey or uh, integrators who are looking at installing hydrogen systems have recognized the additional risk and therefore uh, want some external help uh, without feeling like they have the capabilities to go it alone. Okay, as, as part of that, uh, training has become a big thing for us. <clears throat> so uh, we, 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 yeah, okay, so we, we do have a, um, a hydrogen safety assurance training course, um, but, uh the, the the point here is that people are recognizing that there are specifics around hydrogen and they want to know how to best deal with them so if they don't come to us for safety support then they may well come to, to us for for training and to say okay we, we recognize that our people may need to upskill and we may, may need to upskill our workforce uh to adopt the hydrogen technology please can you take us through that and so We'll, uh, we'll happily uh, engage in that <laughs> training. Okay, QRAs, just like you do for um, a- any uh, g- gas installation or, or p- petrochemical installation, um, where, where we look at you know, gas cloud dispersion and uh, the, 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 the risk local to the plant. Uh, we've actually lost one there. Okay, I think that's similar to uh, safety studies, that one. So, yes, yeah, it's the same sort of thing on that side. And then in in the UK, uh, Desire is the uh, the UK version of of ATEX. But what what we're really saying here is uh, has the atmospheres assessment. Okay, so people are coming to us saying we've heard about this thing called Desire. Please, can you tell us what we need to do? And if you can do it, then that's even better. So people are coming saying, okay, we recognise that hydrogen has an explosive capacity. We've read about this thing called Desire. Please, can you give us some guidance on what we're supposed to do? So th- th- they are really the, the classics of uh, system safety. Um, and, and that's what people are coming to us for. So I, I thought that was an interesting thing. That, no, that there's nothing in there which is unusual or new, actually. OK, so uh, again, we've got um, uh, a hark back to uh, known techniques uh, for risk management. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Okay, here we go. So, first case study. Uh, so, this uh, it, it is uh, admittedly it is um, anonymized, uh, but it, uh, yeah, it, you have to take a word for it that it exists. But fundamentally, what we had to do, uh, what we were asked to do, was provide some planning support for a hydrogen plant. And so, this was a hydrogen plant um, over in Ireland. Uh, and they were amending their planning application to include a hydrogen um, uh, generation plant to be attached to a wind farm. So there's that classic combination of renewable plus hydrogen plant equals green hydrogen. Okay, and so uh, that, what, what they wanted was a, uh, some kind of hazard identification and hazard log report. I said, okay, we'll give a hazard log report. We can do that, no problem. Uh, they wanted a safety management plan so they could demonstrate to their local planning inspector uh, that they were taking that proactive approach. So there you go. There's your safety management plan. 
<coughs> we uh, attended, or I, I attended the uh, Public Information Day. Uh, so uh, th this is slightly unusual for us. We don't usually get involved in these sort of things, but uh, that there was a general attitude by this particular client, uh, which is to be commended that that they ought to be able to provide questions to the public face to face, because uh, who would they be to install such a such a project in a place where people lived without without actually uh, being able to look them in the whites of the eyes? So so we turned up. Uh, we had lots of information uh, and answered questions um, that, that the public had um, about hydrogen, which was incredibly interesting to find out what people really worried about uh, when it came to the adoption of hydrogen and what they were excited about, actually. Um, that, that work extended. Uh, we're now providing a, 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 a quantitative uh, risk assessment piece uh, for that client as well. So and we, we've kind of gone on a bit of a journey with them. And we, we hope to carry on. Uh, difficulty. <coughs> and, uh, uh, so uh, I, I mentioned the... the the legal review of the documentation. So uh, pl planning applications ha have many stakeholders uh, and they would they like to um, have a legal view on what the documents say, which is only fair and just and uh, not unlike uh, other projects. So this is by no means unique to hydrogen project. The, the number of review comments and things on our work from stakeholders which needed answering uh, took its toll actually it was quite a lot of additional work um, but but that was fine uh, we, we can handle that um, and also speaking to the public uh, quite a daunting prospect uh, but ultimately very rewarding and uh, <clears throat> hopefully that although the uh, the response is not back uh, the the client uh, achieved their aims so a, a very interesting piece of work and uh, the the next uh, case study, which which is uh, also interesting from a different point of view, uh, <clears throat> is this uh, idea of uh, an ammonia to hydrogen demonstrator, um, or, or also anonymized. Uh, I appreciate um, you have to take my word for it, but it, yeah, that's where we are. Uh, so the interesting point about this particular project um, is this uh, this graphic here. Okay, so this is a this is a stock image, but it, it, it demonstrates the problem that this company were trying to solve. Okay, so we, we, we see the comparison on the ship here. So uh, hydrogen for a given unit of energy takes two and a half times more volume uh, than uh, liquid natural gas and 1.9 times more than liquid natural gas. Okay, so if you <clears throat> if you think about that uh, in respect of, for example, an airport or a train depot and you think about the space required to store uh, an amount of hydrogen which would be useful for uh, i don't know uh, two, two, two days of bunkered service then the real estate cost ends up becoming rather large two and a half times larger than this the use of liquid natural gas for example uh, so <clears throat> this uh, this this client had a, a project to say, okay, what what do we need to do to solve this? Well, well, let's if we store it as ammonia, which is uh, three hydrogen atoms and, and one nitrogen atom, uh, then we've got more hydrogen per unit space. Okay, as, as is demonstrated, so we can crack that ammonia into hydrogen on site, and we've saved ourselves a whole bunch of space. So that's great. So they came to us and said, okay, what do we need to do? And we said, okay, right, so we can. What, what we're going to say is you, you need a safety management plan. Risk management starts with a safety management plan. You have to lay out what it is you're going to do um, to fulfill your obligations uh, that risks are managed as low as, <coughs> excuse me, reasonably practicable. Uh, and so, yes, we gave a safety management plan. Uh, we had um, ongoing, ongoing support for that. Uh, and the ultimate view is to over, uh, provide an overall safety case report for the ammonia to hydrogen demonstrator. Okay, and the, the hurdle here, <clears throat> again, not, not so much a hurdle, uh, more an, an observation because uh, they clearly had the right approach. Um, but it's, it's a relatively small sort of startup ish company. Um, and when we write our safety management and pl uh, plan and say things like, okay, how are you managing your competence? How are you looking after your safety governance? You know, the, the, these small companies, they don't have it. 
Okay, not not that they don't employ competent people and not that they don't have safety governance, but it's not written down in a process anywhere. And in order to form your overall safety case, like for any uh, high, hazard, high hazard industry, it's things like that which which count. <clears throat> so what we're having to ask is, please demonstrate how you are managing, for example, your competence, uh, and, and that's forcing them to actually define it for themselves. Okay, so whilst I've, I've stated it as a hurdle, it, it's really an observation, uh, and, and again, shows the power of uh, safety management planning when you get to ask people who don't have things like that to actually do it, and it gives them reason to think about it as well. Okay, so again, uh, interesting project, uh, plenty of hazards involved, <clears throat> um, nothing in terms of deliverables, which we wouldn't see from other high hazard industries. And that's why uh, the skills that we have associated with those industries are useful for hydrogen. Okay, so uh, key, key skills that we've picked up. So uh, over the course of our time looking at hydrogen projects, uh, key, key skills are things like um, how, to, how to manage explosive atmospheres. And uh, granted, uh, across the world, different um, regulations apply, uh, but in the Europe, in, in Europe and in the UK, we're talking about ATEX uh, regulations and, and DSEA, the Dangerous Substances Exposed Atmospheres regulations. Um, we, we see a, a lot of functional safety, so there's a lot of functional safety required in order to make sure that um, <coughs> uh, high risk hazards are managed effectively by electrical electronic control systems. Uh, safety management planning, again, uh, nothing out of the ordinary for people in high hazard industries. Uh, coma regulations uh, in, in the UK and the, uh, for, for example, for hydrogen, the lower tier of coma is between five and 50 tonnes and the upper tier is above 50 tonnes. So um, <clears throat> trying to, to make sure that people are or know where they are with respect to that scale. Uh, quantitative risk assessment is also something we've asked for, and as we saw from the pie chart, has ops and, and bow tie diagrams um, n n numerous times. And I, I, I don't know if anyone's familiar with bow ties, but th this is an example here. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into bow ties, but it, it is a familiar tool to many uh, in high hazard industries. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the, the point here, uh, and the point here is that. Um, the skills that we have seen required for hydrogen projects are skills that we have picked up from experience in other high hazard industries. Okay, with a few, with, with recognition of the specific characteristics of hydrogen. Okay, uh, and in, in future developments, so where are we looking at going and where can other people think about going uh, with their uh, hydrogen economy ambitions? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, training is a big thing uh, for us. Uh, yeah, I've sneakily included a uh, a link to our hydrogen course there. Um, uh, but but there are others. There, there's, there's, there's lots of uh, training out there. But but <clears throat> fundamentally, it's a big market. Okay, uh, it's it's a big opportunity for for people providing training for the hydrogen economy. Uh, SMEs and startups. So a lot of people uh, seeking funding uh, to to begin. The, um, the development of products for hydrogen. And a lot of people see um, hydrogen and the new technologies as a viable business, which of course it is. There's lots to be done, uh, but if you're putting um, product on the market, then <clears throat> there, there, there is a route to commercialization. Okay, there are things to do. You have to make sure that you have done things right. You, know, you have obviously legal obligations regarding risk and safety. And so, uh, people are looking out there for support with that commercialization of, of those products. Uh, and when we talk about approvals, um, we, what, what a company seeks to do really is de-risk the approval process and therefore come to uh, someone like us <coughs> for some kind of pre-assessment. -pre so but please tell us that we've done enough to achieve uh, our certification. Uh, okay, let's have a look at your documentation. Uh, right, okay, you've got to do some more work here. Uh, let's keep our eyes on ammonia as an energy carrier. So whilst we're looking at hydrogen uh, as the useful vector, uh, 
it doesn't mean it has to be in its hydrogen form uh, throughout its uh, supply chain. Uh, let's look at people who are interested in ammonia as well, because that could be a key player uh, in the long term for the hydrogen economy. OK, and cl clean energy. <clears throat> so what, what does clean energy actually mean? Well, uh, for, there are ways of defining um, your the cleanliness of your hydrogen and, and Tub Ryland, our parent company, uh, they they have a standard out published already, and they run a service to uh, to uh, uh, certify uh, the uh, the sustainability of a company's hydrogen. Uh, they, they've got a number of case studies uh, on that. And of course, when we start talking about people entering the hydrogen arena. Uh, then we have to think about hydrogen readiness. <clears throat> so it is a is a product ready for hydrogen. We've talked about hydrogen readiness for boilers. Uh, well, you know the, the the approach may be similar, but surely the 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 standards will change. So is is everything that says ready for hydrogen? Is it really ready? Uh, is an organisation ready for hydrogen? Uh, and we we do uh, through to Ryland have a. Uh, hydrogen readiness standard in development. Okay, so th these are just a few areas where we're going to go uh, and where we'll be keeping our eyes on uh, above uh, the, uh, the the classic uh, services uh, that we've seen people interested in already. Okay, and where? So where where are we going to go? Where are we going to take those things? So mobility, planes, trains, automobiles, ferries. These are all uh, uh, future applications of hydrogen, without doubt. You, you can argue one way or the other whether it's going to be uh, hydrogen cars, electric cars, but fundamentally, I think everyone basically accepts it's going to be a blend. <clears throat> so, uh, so where hydrogen fits into the blend of energies for mobility, uh, then that's where we will be looking. Uh, but of course, planes, trains, and automobiles and ferries—they they don't operate in isolation; they need infrastructure. Um, so we, we also keep our eyes on uh, the refueling and transmission um, integrators and the companies involved in that side of the operation. <clears throat> and that, this is uh, a, a big area for us. Uh, products, uh, I, I, like, like I say, let's keep our eyes on the products that are coming forward. Let's make sure that the uh, the certification approach for those products is, is de-risked and that they they have that pre-assessment support when they need it. Uh, and ultimately, <clears throat> the, the people that create um, safe systems are competent people. Uh, one of the ideas that we're playing with through uh, to, to Ryland is this idea of a certified hydrogen systems engineer. So not, not created yet, but watch this space. That's where we're hoping to get to. OK. And that is about the end of my presentation thanks dave well, thank you very much nick that was really really interesting and uh must take my hat off to you <laughs> fighting through with your <laughs> sore throat there um if you want to take a sip of tea uh, feel free <clears throat> um yeah no i mean thanks nick um we've we've had a few questions quite a quite a lot of questions actually here so apologies to anyone if we don't uh don't get around to them so i'm just going to do them in order but i would encourage you if we don't answer your questions please uh, feel free to get in touch after we'll give you the the details after so uh, firstly nick so we've got a question here from uh from zidke he's uh they're asking um please could you say a little bit more about the specific hydrogen hazards associated with a hydrogen fuel cell in an automobile anything uh, anything uh, above and beyond the kind of generic hazards in an automobile okay <clears throat> or, or a bus i presume yeah any kind of you know fuel yeah, cell in a, a vehicle yeah yeah okay okay so <clears throat> um <laughs> So, okay, hydrogen uh, fuel cell generating electricity. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think generally you'd also have a, a decent sized battery in there as well. So you've got um, a, a potentially a lithium ion battery in there as well, uh, which, which carries its own risk. So, yeah, <clears throat> uh, so specific hazards for, for vehicles, I suppose. Yes, um, yes. Is, uh, so, uh, crashworthiness, uh, making sure that. 
uh, any stored hydrogen is is released to a uh, the, the say in the safest route possible should the tank rupture. So we've obviously got people on there. We've got hydrogen stored in uh, compressed uh, form uh, beneath people's seats, perhaps, or somewhere else. And, and, and I think the specific hazards would come from the architecture of the vehicle. So, so the, the 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 characteristics of hydrogen uh, plus the uh, architecture of the vehicle uh, when submitted to um, analysis by robust means such as HAZOP, et cetera, um, sh should give you a, a, a good view of that. But fundamentally, we want to be keeping people away from leaked hydrogen. Okay. Yep, very good. Thank you. Um, yeah, a question from Sue. So um, what type of projects are RiskTech experiencing where risk assessment is applied, but more generally uh, from a from the point of view, uh, is it new projects or is it retrofit projects, Nick, or what are we seeing? Uh, generally new, generally uh, new projects, actually. Um, so, you know, uh, we get a lot of uh, inquiries <coughs> from um, wind farm uh, um, uh, uh, teams, so people, but where, where, where companies get together to, to put wind farms in and a uh, wind farm uh, works well with an electrolyzer to generate electricity, particularly for things like island community. So oh, I'd, I'd say I'd say new builds, actually. I'd say new builds. Okay, great. Um, yeah, a question from uh, Mafuz. So um, since hydrogen projects are complex, uh, from your experience in terms of HSC and process safety, um, any additional measures or studies required? So I know you talked through some on the slides there quickly, but what kind of breadth of studies are you seeing and any ones that are kind of unique to hydrogen? Uh, okay, uh, so so it, it's driven by regulation. So the studies that you do um, are, are generally driven by the applicable regulations and the, the, the regulations require you to do a risk assessment. So we we do uh, we we, uh, we yeah okay we we've done uh, uh, detailed hazops on electrolyzer designs and then the balance of plant uh, and we've done uh, slightly more coarse level hazard identification studies um, on uh, uh, hydrogen system concepts uh, so <clears throat> so so yeah re really uh, a lot of early stage stuff I think. Okay. Not sure I answer the question there, actually. No, that's fine. No, I, th I, I think, yeah, yeah, as you say, it's, it's driven by regulation, isn't it, depending yeah. on the, the country you're in. And a lot of the studies do seem to be the, the familiar ones, really, don't they, for yeah. uh, for yeah, us sorry. process engineers that's just uh, reapplying it, bearing in mind the characteristics and stuff. So, yeah, yeah no, yeah. I think I think uh, that's clear, Nick. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, another question from Sue. As I say, I'm just doing these in order. Um, so case study one, you mentioned the general public and the public consultation. What was the general public appetite uh, for hydrogen and has the project progressed? Uh, okay, so uh, the uh, project's still in the application phase. Um, and uh, generally from the public, uh, th they were um, supportive, <coughs> with, with, with exceptions, obviously. <laughs> um, pe pe people um, were l less worried about the hydrogen, more worried about the vehicles uh, in, in many cases, uh, worried about the noise, um, worried about the effects on the local environment, uh, worried about the effect on the groundwater. So. Where, where we use um, uh, boreholes for um, water sources, uh, then they were concerned about the effect that would have on their own borehole. <clears throat> uh, people were l less worried about um, the uh, flammability and explosive elements, which is what we would be generally worried about um, in a high hazard from a high hazard background. That's really interesting. I wonder if people yeah. just don't associate the word hydrogen with the same feelings as a word like gas or methane or something. That's interesting, um, isn't it? It, it? it is interesting, actually. It, it is very interesting. Um, and uh, I think uh, what, it, it, what it means <clears throat> is that there's, uh, in that example, there, there is 
generally um, in the general public anyway f- from that example only so i'm not i'm not generalizing um not so much of an understanding of the additional risk profile so so what that in turn means is that as an industry we have a massive responsibility to do the right thing uh, because not only are we looking after the reputation of our own companies and our own businesses but we're looking after the reputation of the industry as a whole okay i think that's a, that's a key takeaway here really is uh you know everybody who's involved in this uh, and if this is the way that we're going to decarbonize the world then uh, if it falls out of public favor uh, due to safety concerns, then we'll get nowhere. So we, we do all of us have an op- have an obligation to uh, to support it from a, a safe point of view. That's yeah, really, really interesting, Nick. There, yeah, I'm just thinking in my head to some of the disasters over the years, like with nuclear power being in favour and then going out of favour. Yeah. You know, regardless of yeah. of what your beliefs are, there's people were on board, weren't they? And then things happened, and it goes, you know, right. uh, it becomes a uh, you know something that people don't want to know yeah. about anymore so and we yeah. don't want that we want people to <laughs> yeah that's right make up a new one yeah come yeah. up with something else <laughs> um, okay thanks yeah um a question there's so this i think this is quite a hard question nick so apologies but a question uh, from surya one um how profitable is it to produce hydrogen from geothermal emissions uh, so thinking here about for example hydrogen sulfide desulfurization so i guess that is a, a tricky question in terms of profitability but I mean practicality even I suppose is is as much been going on in that arena in terms of making the hydrogen from from a hydrogen sulfide or desulfurization processes uh well I mean it's it's an interesting one I I guess the uh the the key there is you've got to be local to the source uh, so it's it's not an area that we've we've been involved in, <clears throat> um, but so I, I guess really I I can't really answer that question. Uh, I haven't I haven't looked at it in any detail. Uh, certainly in terms of profitability, um, I, I I don't really have much to offer from a uh, from a business perspective in that respect. I think that's a very good point though, Nick, about the you know being located close to the source isn't it because if you've got (coughs) overwhelming amounts of anything then you know doing something nearby is is got to be you know far more worthy of consideration than you know doing it doing it in the wrong place so yeah i think uh i think sorry one's at the at the edge here uh, but it's certainly an interesting uh interesting point i'd say i'd say that um generation at the point of use is something that should be looked at wholeheartedly uh, because um, if you've got your green hydrogen, uh, it's not very green if you have to ship it a thousand miles by a diesel lorry. Okay, <laughs> so, so if, if you are uh, somewhere where uh, you have a natural source of hydrogen sulfide um, or if you, if you have a source of that which is going, going to waste, then if there's a way to, to strip the hydrogen out then uh, and, and use it at that point of generation, uh, then by all means, uh, g- go for it. And then I, I guess the profitability in that case would very much depend on a case-by-case basis. Yeah, yeah we've, uh, it's actually, we've only got two questions left here, which is good timing. So I think if we could, we could probably finish them if we, apologies if we run ever so slightly over, but they're both actually linked to what you just said there Nick so um, Michael has said uh, with hydrogen for heating what is the advantage of using green hydrogen for heating um, instead of keeping it on site and using it when power demand rises so so just thinking that through really so yeah oh, okay okay so, yeah. so so burn it rather than burn it as yes. a gas rather than convert it to power when mm-hmm. uh, when the wind stops blowing, yeah. <laughs> effectively. Um, well, it, uh, there's, there's there's no uh, benefit or, or disbenefit really. I, I think what you'd have to do in that case is is really look at uh, the individual load cases to see how much would be burnt to heat, for example, a house or an office, uh, versus uh, the, the efficiency of converting to uh, power to use it for lighting your house. Uh, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, uh, Steve, again, a, a similar-ish point in terms of points of creation and points of use. So um, is using ammonia as a carrier better than using electrolysis of water on site to produce your hydrogen? So I guess this touches on the transportation of ammonia rather than, you know, doing electrolysis on site. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I, again, I, I think that you'd have to consider. There's no, there's no right or wrong to any of this, and that, that's that's one of the key points mm. is, is that you have to look at the application. Okay, and if you are, um, I don't know, uh, in, in a port where having shipped hydrogen uh, come to your local area. So uh, shipped ammonia come to your local area is feasible, then it would be probably better, I think, and cheaper to to use that hydro, that uh, ammonia mm -hmm. if the infrastructure allowed it, because um, ammonia is generated in, for industry and shipped all over the world anyway. Okay, so that that happens currently, um, whether we had hydrogen in our economy or not. Okay, uh, but. If you want to think about um, generating hydrogen from water electrolysis, <clears throat> then you know you, you have all sorts of uh, upfront costs to think about, uh, and the, the payback therefore on that investment would have to be worked out in order to decide for that particular application uh, whether you should be buying it in as ammonia and then cracking it into hydrogen, uh, or generating your hydrogen on site. Uh, and you know, with, with all these things. It, it very much depends on the application. Okay. Uh, so, so I know I said no more questions, Nick, but we've got one just that that's sneaked right. in from Emra, Emra here. So um, are there any design engineering practices or codes for hydrogen? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, <clears throat> there, there's many, uh, depending on whereabouts in the world you are. Uh, what, what I would advise is um, going to the h2tools.org website um and they they have a whole section on that kind of thing uh, and then there's there's the, there are many sources of um uh, advice on standards and regulations for hydrogen projects okay okay so yeah. you, please please forgive me for not reciting a list um, <laughs> but but they, they, they do exist there's guidance out there and the h2tools.org website um, pr provides quite a lot of that guidance. It seems very good. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. So I think we I think we need to wrap up there. We've just gone ever so slightly over time, but we've, that's all the we've got an answer to everybody's question, which is great. Uh, as we've always said, you know, if you want to get in touch with Nick, uh, Nick's email address is just nick.taylor at risktech.tuv.com. So if you think of something later or you had something that you wanted to ask today but you didn't get round to doing, then just, just send Nick an email or you can contact uh, Risk Tech through our inquiries form on our website, Market for Attention of Nick, or just send it in generally and, and somebody will get back to you. So um, we've been recording this today, so we'll make the recording available later uh, this week. Um, when you leave the webinar, you might receive a survey in your browser. Um, if you do, it only takes 30 seconds, and we do appreciate if you could complete that. Um, also, just worth reminding you, we put all our web webinars on a YouTube channel, so we've got around 50 of them on there now. So if you just type the uh, Risk Tech YouTube channel into Google, then you'll find our page and uh, a selection of webinars and also, also shorter videos, which we call Risk Tech Bite Size, which are just answers to short questions.